The Boy Who Lived by Louise Charlton Chapter 3 Joy and Sorrow Harry wasn't sure of exactly how long he had been kissing Ginny for. Time had vanished in the creation of their own small universe, and the sounds of large feet shuffling along the corridor and the creaking of an opening door had failed to penetrate the thunderous booming reverberating in Harry's head. Only the sound of Ron's indignant bellowing did that. Oi, watch it, that's my sister! The pair pulled apart instantly and found the source of the shouting, staring his sister out whilst holding his wand to Harry's chest. Well, what did you want? Ginny asked Ron, more calmly than Harry was expecting, but not breaking her piercing glare at Ron the entire time. If you knew what was good for him, he'd back down now, Harry thought. But he didn't, and maintained his position between them. Well, why are you in my room? Ginny asked again, retaining her tone and glare. It was too quiet in here, and now I know why, Ron shouted, half triumphant, half indignant. Oh, right, I see. So if I kiss Harry louder, you won't feel the need to butt in. I see how it is, Ginny retorted, enraged. It all happened in a quick second. Ron, whose wand was still pointing at Harry's chest, was burning Ginny with a stare so hard that sparks flew out of the end of his wand, forcing Harry to dart out of the way. And whilst Ginny saw what Harry had been forced to do and was shouting at Ron for it, she didn't see a tall figure with messy, jet-black hair creep around the back of Ron and to her side. Then Harry slipped his fingers through hers and she fell silent immediately, forgetting her train of thought, forgetting her anger at Ron, a massive grin now on her face. But Hermione broke the short-lived silence after coming up the stairs to investigate the source of the shouting. "'What's going on? Why is there shouting?' she asked the room. It was Ron who found his voice first. "'Harry's been messing with Ginny's heart again, that's what,' he quickly supplied, his cheeks flaring crimson in anger. Enraged, Harry replied, "'Hey, I'm not messing with Ginny's heart. I love her.' "'Yeah, right,' Ron spat. "'If you loved her, you wouldn't have left her.' "'Ron, that's not fair,' Ginny interjected. But Harry squeezed her hand and said, "'Don't bother, Ginny. You understand, and that's the important thing. Ron will be Ron and not listen to anyone because he's already made up his mind about it, so there's no point wasting your breath trying to explain it to him. It's sad, but there you go. Harry then gave Ginny's hand another squeeze before striding out of the room and next door into Percy's room, where he heard Ginny scream at Ron, Happy now? and Hermione give an exasperating groan through the wall. He then heard Ron leave the room to avoid the upcoming lecture from Hermione, hearing his large footsteps shuffle along the hallway and up the stairs to his bedroom, after a slamming of the door, when an exasperated Hermione screamed, Boys! at the top of her voice. Meanwhile, in the quaint village square of Ottery St. Catchpole, the late afternoon sun was warm and pleasant, lighting up the war memorial and the rickety old buildings nearby. In the window of the sweet shop, there were several jars filled with sweets, glistening at passers-by. But in the heat of the day, the village was quiet. The local residents, who usually hung around the shops or did gardening in their front gardens, were staying inside in the shade. Even the walkers didn't brave the warmth of the sun to cross the square into the pub, instead hurrying onwards to the more shaded village on the other side of the hill. It was in the still of this peaceful afternoon that a small pop in the middle of Ottery St. Catchpole's village square broke the silence. A tall, slightly haggard white blonde figure had appeared out of thin air under the shade of a large oak tree. He looked around intently on the spot and, avoiding the bright, sunlit square, skirted around the edge in intense pursuit of something unknown to him. It was only when he was in the shade of a small medieval church that he found what he was looking for, a wrought iron gate. He opened it and walked through the cemetery in silence, mostly following the path, occasionally darting off it in pursuit of what appeared to be thin air. It was only once he had reached the point where the path bent round to the side, leaving a cluster of trees up ahead, that Draco Malfoy stopped, knowing he had found the right place, the best place to bury a wizard. Looking down at his watch, Malfoy climbed into the cluster of trees from the side and settled himself in a large bush, waiting for the fast-approaching dusk. After Ron's outburst, the burrow was uncharacteristically quiet for the rest of the day. When Bill and Flo arrived, noise finally erupted again as Mrs Weasley rushed around in a panic, roping Harry, Ron, Charlie and Bill to help Mr Weasley erect a large tent in the paddock where it had been before for Bill and Fleur's wedding. She had then prepared dinner in a frenzied panic with the reluctant help of Fleur, Ginny and Hermione. George had been totally absent all afternoon and didn't make it down for dinner, but with the addition of Ginny, Bill and Fleur, they were still knocking each other's elbows. Then there was the tension between Harry and Ron. Ron had now concentrated his piercing glare at Harry, who in response maintained a blank look to the left of Ron's shoulder and the entire room was silent. Immediately after dinner, Mr Weasley, Bill, Charlie and Percy changed into muggle attire and went to various different places to meet people coming to the funeral. Too many wizards apparating into the same area could arouse suspicion, Mr Weasley had explained earlier that day. The rest of the group rose soon after and changed in their respective rooms in silence before meeting in the hall. Mrs Weasley led them all out of the burrow, through the fields and into the village, passing a number of muggle houses, no doubt full of curious muggles. They made their way past some rickety old buildings before coming to a halt by the war memorial, where Harry's thoughts turned to what he was expecting to see. 
the only funeral he had ever been to was dumbledore's and harry somehow suspected that fred's was going to be nothing like that it would be more ordinary harry tried not to think about it too much harry wasn't left alone with his thoughts for too long just as the sun started to hide behind the hill figures were appearing in the distance as they came closer they became personified and harry recognised some of them at the front were four official-looking ministry wizards one of whom harry recognised as the wizard who had presided over both dumbledore's funeral and bell and fleur's wedding hovering a coffin between them harry felt immensely relieved on knowing that he wouldn't have to look at fred's body behind them were members of the order of the phoenix and dumbledore's army most of the hogwarts professors oliver wood and the twins's assistant at weasley's wizard wheezes coming up behind them was charlie supporting muriel on his arm and a number of other redheads as well as the delacours due to the vast number of people attending the groups filtered straight through the small wrought iron gate single file nodding as they passed the group from the burrow as they went except for the weasleys at the back of the procession who on reaching the group at the square merged with them and they all made their way into the cemetery together george tagging along behind looking pale and gaunt for the first time in harry's knowledge as harry had suspected the ceremony was simple there were no speeches or eulogies they simply gathered around the coffin each remembering their dear friend brother son and comic joker before an official ministry wizard gathered the earth over the coffin with a swish of his wand as he bade the soul of a man he never knew to rest in peace for the initial few seconds after the engraving had been finished and the ministry officials left the scene everyone stayed for a moment saying their own good-bye except the lovegoods who had crept in at the back unnoticed and sang a horrible lament in some unknown language to keep away the disparates before turning away and heading back towards the village square filtering through the gate single file and following mr weasley back to the burrow and then only george remained who had spent the entire time looking at the headstone marking the place where he was leaving his brother forever whilst he carried on with his journey George took a few paces forward and reached out his hand, tracing the recently engraved lettering with his fingers, each letter forming the words, Fred Weasley, 1st of April 1978 to 2nd of May 1998. May there be toilet seats in the afterlife. And then he smiled for the first time in weeks as he remembered his brother. All of his jaw muscles began to ache, and then on remembering how Fred had been smiling in the last moments of his life, his face fell again. He turned around and walked away, unable to keep control of his emotions any more. As he drew near the gate, George saw the short, plump figure of his mother waiting for him there, and quickly snuck in a final look at his brother. Squinting into the far distance, he could just make out the bright headstone which, once weathered into the surroundings, would stop glistening in the moonlight, and blend into the landscape completely. Initially, when George saw the white blonde figure emerge from the leaves and approach the headstone, he wanted to shout out, but on discovering what he was doing, his respect for Draco Malfoy suddenly increased. As George turned around to meet his mother, he smiled. Miracles do happen. And as he headed towards the burrow with Mrs. Weasley, he decided to never tell a soul what he had witnessed this evening, especially not Draco, for his sake. It would be their little secret. Just to be sure that he was completely alone, Draco counted to thirty after George disappeared. This was hard enough on its own, without him creating a scene. He climbed out of the bush and paced over to the large lump that contained one of the funniest people he had ever met in its depths beneath the headstone. Well, it's now or never, Draco reminded himself before looking directly at the headstone, illuminated by the moonlight, whispering softly but clearly. I'm so sorry you died, and that I had a part in it, he began. At first, I was naive, believing all the claptrap the Death Eaters feed you. Then I was a coward, unlike you. You, you fought for what you believed in, to create a better world. You two are actually pretty funny and talented. Your joke shop stuff is proof of that. You had a real gift, and now because of me you'll never get to share that with the world ever again. Draco's voice wavered slightly before he finished. I salute you, brother. The tears were falling, yet he did nothing to stop them. He wasn't ashamed of how he felt. He felt this way about all of Voldemort's victims, but it was difficult to get out to these things, especially if it clashed with his aunt's funeral. But he was glad to have made it today, to our recent catchpole. It was as he was paying his final respects to Fred that he saw a flash of orange out of the corner of his eye. He froze on the spot and looked around for a moment before concluding that it must have been because he was thinking about Fred.